Two days after the sudden resignation of two members of the National Statistical Commission, including the chairman, Business Standard has accessed a jobs report by the National Sample Survey Office that shows unemployment rate at a 45-year high of 6.1%. What does this mean? This means that unemployment in India has hit the highest level since 1973. It is believed that the NSC members quit because the government refused to release the jobs report despite the NSC's approval. Now, the report, which is not made public yet, says that unemployment is higher in urban areas as compared to rural parts of the country. The report also says that labour force participation rate declined from 39.5% in 2011 to 12 to 36.9% in 2017 to 2018. Now, opposition parties are attacking the government, questioning Prime Minister Modi over the jobs promise he made in 2014. Congress President Rahul Gandhi says, and I quote, the Fuhrer promised us two crore jobs a year. Five years later, his leaked job creation report card reveals a national disaster, unquote. If you rely on Pakoda nomics, this is what's going to happen. You need to concentrate on and, and take care of people's concerns on the ground. At the moment, there is no private investment taking place in this country. You know, even if you look at the stock market, it's the top 10 companies that are pulling up the market, the middle section and the lower section, the market is completely tanked. He thinks only of the digital India. He forgets the real India and that's what, why we are, we are where we are today. Because they have virtually destroyed the National Statistical Commission. So how will they publish the data? What little credibility there was is completely lost now. Unemployment rate, unemployment rate is at a high, not low. The unemployment rate is at a high of about 6.1% or so. But that's because no jobs are created. Today the employment data has come out. The government doesn't look uh, on firm footing as far as the employment data. Again, opposition is saying government was deliberately keeping the employment data away from public domain because it's not flattering. No, you see, in so far as the growth rate is concerned, the growth rate is higher. I, I, we are growing at the fastest rate of all the major economies. And the employment will follow. Much of the employment is actually not in the formal field. Mm. The fact that the economy is growing means, and the fact that the, the poverty, uh, the numbers on the poverty line have crashed, means that a lot of uh, in employment businesses, small businesses are thriving. So you think when you go into the electoral exams, we'll the win. voters will we'll give win. you a pass? Absolutely, we'll win. I mean, we'll win. This is a Niradhar controversy, a Niradhar vivaat. The most important thing is what the country's need is. It's the most important thing. जो होगी कार्रवाई वो होगी अब केवल मात्र विपक्ष ये चाहता है वैसा हो या सत्ताधारी पार्टी ने कुछ रुख लिया है उसका संबंध इस बात से नहीं है कि राजनीतिक प्राथमिकताएं या राजनीतिक मुद्दा क्या है ये इसका आधार ये रहना चाहिए कि देश की आवश्यकता क्या है in less than 24 hours from now, Finance Minister Piyush Goyal will present what will be the government's last budget ahead of the Lok Sabha elections later this year. And from what we're picking up uh, from our sources, the government may announce a farm package on the lines of those rolled out by the Odisha and Madhya Pradesh state governments. Remember, the stress in the farm sector has been one of the key themes dominating the budget narrative this time around. Parikshit Lutra joins us now. Parikshit, what are you picking up from your sources? After the loss in recent assembly elections, the government has been studying several models, several schemes in order to support farmers in different parts of the country. We believe they have finally zeroed in on uh, two state schemes. One is Odisha's Krushak Assistance for Livelihood and Income Augmentation. Uh, the government feels that this is something that can be implemented nationwide. They feel that it's better than uh, the Raitu Bandhu scheme of Telangana because it includes tenant cultivators as well. Uh, as far as the Odisha scheme goes, it supports small and marginal farmers to the extent of uh, 10,000 rupees per year. It's divided into two crop seasons. It also supports uh, landless households and provides them 12,500 uh, per year for uh, raising poultry, goats, ducks and uh, fishery as well. Uh, there is another scheme that has been studied and that is a deficiency payment uh, mechanism that has been followed by the Madhya Pradesh government. It's called the Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana. So in some form, the government may bring in a deficiency payment uh, scheme where they would compensate people if there is a difference between the actual income and the potential income from certain notified crops. Let's wait and see what the budget fine print now is. 
Absolutely. We're going to have to wait and watch tomorrow. Thank you so much for all those details, Parikshit. In fact, we spoke to Arvind Subramanian, the former chief economic advisor, yesterday. And remember, he has pitched for an income support scheme that proposes to transfer 18,000 rupees per year to each rural household. Arvind Subramanian has pegged the cost of this scheme at 1.3% of the GDP, with a total outlay of 2.64 lakh crore rupees. Now, Subramanian feels that it is possible to implement a scheme on the lines of Telangana government's agriculture investment support scheme, commonly known as the to Bandhu scheme at the centre. He feels the Kalya scheme, on the other hand, would be an administrative nightmare. Take a look. With a version of universal basic income, let's apply it to rural India because that's where the distress is most acute. And let's try and do better than existing schemes that are trying to address a similar problem. So as we said, uh, you know, um, loan waivers, right to Bandhu, Kalia, uh, not Kalia, uh, loan waivers and right to Bandhu especially are highly regressive. They only benefit the very rich farmers because only the very rich can borrow from official sources or only the very rich have land. Uh, so uh, let's uh, kind of uh, do this in rural India, but do it in a way where implementation would be much simpler. Kalia, for example, also I think uh, is administratively very difficult to implement because you have to identify landed farmers, tenants, laborers. You know, it's kind of almost like an administrative yeah. nightmare. So what we're saying is that take mm. that principle, extend it to almost all rural households, and do it based not on hmm. targeting in beneficiaries, which has been, you know, the bane of anti-poverty programs in India. It's so difficult to target. Instead, exclude out, you know, at some cutoff who you think may not deserve this as much. Okay. And that's how you get a quasi-universal basic rural income. It's one day to go for the budget and with elections around the corner, CNBC TV 18 learns that fighting poverty will be big on the agenda for the government. Sources in the note tell CNBC TV 18 that this will be through a hike in fund allocation towards the National Social Assistance Program in FY20. Anshu Sharma has been tracking that story carefully and joins us now. Anshu, take us through the details of what you're picking up. That's right. We understand from sources that poverty alleviation will be a key issue to watch out for both budget and election, sources indicate. Government may look at hiking budget allocation towards National Social Assistance Program, which comes under Rural Development Ministry. Under NSAP or National Social Assistance Program, funds are directly transferred to beneficiaries for schemes like old age pension, Pension for specially abled and widow pension. Last year, budgetary allocation for NSAP was at 9,975 crore rupees. Meanwhile, for the upcoming general election, the government is set to highlight its rural development achievements in a big way. Some of the highlights will be like uh, uh, building of over 44 lakh uh, houses under Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana till FI 18 against 10 lakh, uh, 10.53 lakh houses built uh, until FI 14. Pace of road building under Pradhan Mantri Sadak Yojana shot up to 138 kilometers per day in FI 18 compared to 73 kilometers kilometers per day in FI14. It's also going to highlight that rural connectivity has reached 90% in FI18 versus 56% in FI14. Rise in rural uh, scheme payments via DBT or direct benefit transfer is now at 100% against 37% percent in FI14. Interestingly, it will also highlight Brookings uh, report that came out in December 2018, which noted that India's poverty rate will drop below 3 percent by the end of 2019. We'll have to see how will this pan out for the ruling party in the general election and what's in store for NSAP in this budget. Back to you. Absolutely. Anshu, thank you so much for those details. Angry Supreme Court bench has summoned Sahara Group's chief, Shubrotha Roy, for a personal appearance on the 28th of February. This comes after Roy failed to refund over 10,000 crore rupees more to his investors. Now, the Apex Court even threatened to initiate contempt proceedings against him. Ashmit Kumar is here with more details. Ashmit, some scathing observations from the court there. Take us through all the action. Indeed, the Apex Court making its position quite clear that it has absolutely no confidence in the Sahara coming through on their assurances of issuing the total payment of 25,000 crore rupees. Keep in mind that that's the kind of figure that they're looking at in terms of total repayment, 25,000 odd crores is what they're looking at. However, the total principal that they've deposited so far comes up to only about 15,000 crore rupees, pointing at a deficit of 10,000 crore rupees. 
Now, that is something that Justin Gover made his opinion clear that it seems from the conduct of the parties that uh, there is no confidence that they will come through, that they have any intentions of coming through with the payment of the balance 10,000 crore rupees. And on the back of that, the Supreme Court is taking a tough stance and making it abundantly clear that they see no option but to summon Subhuto Roy Sahara in person uh, to appear before the Apex Court at the date of the next hearing, which is February 28th. Not just that, the Supreme Court has also slipped in an important caveat. The caveat essentially is is that they have said, uh, have issued a veiled threat, so to speak, whereby they've said that the consequences shall follow and that the law should be taken to its logical conclusion for non-payment, for non-compliance with the Supreme Court order. Keep in mind that earlier the Supreme Court had, in fact, uh, sent Subhuto Roy uh, to jail for about nearly two years and had released them only after much deliberations and much uh, legal battle before the apex court. So clearly the Supreme Court is looking to play hardball as of right now. The next date of hearing, of course, will be February 28th. All right, Ashmit. Thank you so much for all those details. Now on to all the political news of the day. It is a massive setback for the BJP in Rajasthan yet again as the Congress emerges victorious in the Ramgad by polls with a margin of over 12,000 votes. With that win, Congress has now touched the halfway mark in the 200-seat assembly in the state. The Congress candidate, Shafia Zubair, secured 44.77% of the votes against 38.2% votes cast for the BJP's Sukhwan Singh. The Ramgad bipoles could not be held with the other constituencies because of the death of a BSP candidate ahead of the December 7th elections. But in the Jind bipole in Haryana, the BJP candidate Krishan Midda has won. The Jananayak Janta Party's Digvijay Chautala was leading in the earlier rounds but dropped to second position while the Congress's heavyweight candidate Randeep Surjewala came in third. Counting had to be stopped temporarily after a ruckus broke out in front of the counting centre with the opposition alleging EVM malfunction. To the interim CBI chief case where Justice N.V. Ramana has recused himself from the matter, becoming the third judge to do so. Justice Ramana has said that he has had a personal association with Nageshwar Rao and has also attended his daughter's wedding. Two judges, including the Chief Justice Ranjan Gogoi, has already recused themselves from the case which was filed by the non-profit organization Common Cause. It had approached the Apex Court challenging the centre's decision to appoint Rao as interim CBI director, arguing that only a selection panel could appoint a director for the agency. Hundreds of Indian students in the United States of America face a potential risk of being deported back to India. In a major crackdown, the federal agents conducted a sting to identify foreign students who tried to stay in the country illegally. According to the U.S. Attorney's Office, eight individuals have been arrested as part of a criminal probe into the potential abuse of the student visa system. Rishika, Rishika Sadam joins us now from Hyderabad. Rishika, fill us in on what you're picking up. Well, we do understand that about 600 students were detained in the USA after the Customs and the Immigration Department has conducted raids across USA. And of these 600 students are also from this university, University of Farmington, which has been a fake university, which has been set up by the feds to crack down this, this massive sting of this fraudulent visa, student visa status. Now, just to give a quick background, why this actually happens is every student after a master's course is supposed to apply for a work visa, which is the H-1 visa visa and in three attempts if they did not get the h1 visa they are they have to get back to their country or the place they belong to so these students have been going to these universities applying a double pg status which gives them a fraudulent status of visa of student visa to show it to the homeland department saying that they're still students but in reality that they're not they've already finished the course they've been working elsewhere they just get a fraudulent student visa status to show to the homeland department and continue staying in the u.s while they give a shot at the work visa again now we do understand six to seven middlemen have also been taken into custody a charge sheet has been filed in them in the district court of michigan where they sick where the seven men have been allegedly taking tuition fee from the students and also been arranging these phony records and fake documents and transcripts from the fed, fed authorities who've called themselves an administration of this particular university now the lot of authorities a lot of associations in hyderabad as well as in india which have been working closely with the homeland department 
department and they say that they're trying every possible situation to negotiate to at least keep those students in the US whose documentation is exact and avoid deportation. So it's yet to be seen, more details are awaited. The student list is not out yet as of exactly how many students have been uh, detained and how many have been uh, taken into custody. But yes, all of the students who belong to this particular university have not been going to the offices, have been moved to other places so that they do not get caught by the authorities. Most of them have also voluntarily taken this step to come back to the country. Now, once a student gets caught in any of these scams, they have their entry banned into that country for about three to ten years. To avoid all of these situations, the associations are also working very closely with the Homeland Department to determine the next course of action. Right, Rishika, many thanks for all those details. Moving on, French glass manufacturer St. Gobain has expanded its Mammoth Chennai facility. The company announced an additional investment of 1,200 crore rupees to its world glass complex in the city. This now brings the company's total investments in the facility to around 3,400 crore rupees. St. Gobain's global chairman and CEO Pierre Andre exclusively spoke to CNBC TV 18's Jude Sanit on these plans, the company's blueprint for India, and on the economy in general. Here's a slice of that conversation. What does this expansion plan, this 1,000 well, we, crore rupee expansion plan, do as far as your India growth prospect? To follow the market mm -hmm. and expand towards more value-added glass. Right. So we offer more and more solutions mm -hmm. uh, and not just uh, a pure glass, mm -hmm. both for automotive and architectural applications. You know, the, the Indian market in terms of uh, 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 flat glass is growing at around 8% per year. Right. So we have a good export base mm -hmm. for the Gulf for the Southeast Asian markets, mm -hmm. uh, for parts of Africa, where we export from here. Right. And given this facility with the three float lines, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll be able to increase the part of value added glass and then to increase a little bit export. Where do you see yourself capitalizing on what on the situation? There's also well, low commodity prices as well. You know, it's an additional whammy for if you. I, if I look like the last 20 years, we have grown at a compound annual growth rate mm -hmm. uh, closer to 20% than 8. Right. So we are growing faster than the market mm -hmm. and mostly because we follow the growth mm -hmm. and India still has a low penetration rate for our solutions. Right. Our solution will provide comfort, sustainability, mm -hmm. and they are, if you take the consumption per head mm -hmm. in India, mm -hmm for a, a plasterboard, for glass, it is still much lower mm -hmm. than uh, countries like China or, right. or even or Europe. Dharavi, an area in Mumbai, is considered one of the largest slums in Asia. We learn from sources that Dubai-based Settling Group is leading to re reading the race to redevelop the massive space of land. Remember, the project to redevelop Dharavi has been in the works since 2004, and the concerned authority invited fresh bids in November last year. Kevin Lee, who has been tracking that story, joins us now with more details. Kevin, how is the bidding progressing, and by when can we expect a final winner? It's been 15 years in the making and finally the Dharavi redevelopment project seems to be getting off to a start. Financial bids were opened late last night with Dubai-based Settling Group emerging as the highest bidder. There were two bidders, Settling Group and Adani Realty. Settling Group's bid was about 7,200 crores, which was about 2,700 crore rupees higher than Adani Realty. The final call on allotments is going to be taken by a committee involving BMC members by the next week. Once that allotment is done, the winner will form an SPV with the government. It's an 80-20 SPV that will be formed and then work will start. Like you mentioned, the Dharavi Redevelopment Authority had invited bids in November and had to extend the deadlines three times. They actually wanted at least three developers to bid, but because of weak demand, they've settled only for two. So hopefully this time around, the redevelopment will be successful. Absolutely. So we're going to have to wait and watch for that. Thank you so much for all those details, Kevin. But with that, it is a wrap on this edition of Reporter's Diary. Many thanks for watching. But up next is our special show, Countdown to the Budget, Agri and Commodities, where we speak to experts on what they expect from the budget and ways to improve farmers' income. Stay tuned for that.